Our next speaker today is, and our last speaker actually, is uh, Diana Perryman. Now, Diana undertook her undergraduate education in Sydney um, and she works as a physiotherapist in Sydney. Um, she has just completed, I think, her PhD and she's presenting three papers today um, based on her research. Um, her first paper is the relationship between age-related hypokyphosis and the frequency of movement in the thoracic spine. Um, she will take questions um, after each paper, I think. Um, please welcome Diana to this podium now. Thank you very much. Um, I will try and uh, present these papers as much as I can as a narrative because they all come from my PhD research, uh, but they're slightly mixed up in order, so I'll try. So this first paper that I'm presenting to you today um, is looking at the uh, relationship between age-related hyperkyphosis of the thoracic spine and the frequency of movement. So just by way of background, um, as we know, we, we all become more kyphosed as we age, or not all of us, but most of us. And a hyperkyphosis has been defined as, as a thoracic kyphosis greater than 40 degrees. So this increasing kyphosis, although it is a function of bony change, it's also a function of soft tissue changes. And the disc is a major contributor to these soft tissue um, contrib contributions to thoracic kyphosis or hyperkyphosis. And in fact, in um, a study, a huge study with over 1,100 um, participants in the US, they found that it was degenerative disc disease and not vertebral fracture or osteoporosis, which was most related to hyperkyphosis in both men and women. And this accords with findings which show that we actually do become much stiffer in our thoracic spines as we age. So is there a relationship between degenerative disc disease and vertebral morphometry? Well, in fact, there is. And a very interesting stu recent study by Mallon and Brown, um, where they nucleotized or nu did nucleotomies on baboon discs. Okay, so they stuck needles in and they, they damaged their disc, gave them artificially induced uh, degenerative disc disease. They showed an almost immediate um, reaction in the bone adjacent to that damage. And you can see here is the damaged disc, and you can see these sort of halos occurring here in the bone. And what they got was an acute bone marrow depletion and trabecular bone necrosis. And that was almost immediately followed by this intense um, re, uh, osteo, oste oh, well, regeneration of the bone, but um, with a, a change in the, in the uh, vertebral morphometry. And this accords with what we see in humans, in human bone and with discs, where you've got this disc disease, you get changes in the morphometry of the bone. And in fact, on the other side, um, Keller and Roberts have reported that it's the increased hydrostatic pressure from the discs um, that leads to the increased compressive stiffness and thickness of subchondral bone. So this may explain why disc degeneration is so strongly related to hyperkyphosis. Now, why do discs degenerate? Well, fundamentally, it's because they lack nutrition. That is really the final pathway. Um, nutrition to the discs, as you know, occurs primarily through diffusion, through the marrow contact channels in the end plates of the vertebrae. Um, and we know that this diffusion process must be related to movement um, because disc, it's been shown that discs adjacent to immobilized vertebrae degenerate much faster than their, their, uh, the other discs in the same spine. So it has been reported, and we think we know, that dynamic disc compression increases disc hydration and nutrition, whereas sustained compression loading reduces disc hydration and nutrition and leads to degeneration. And in fact, an important finite model um, developed relatively recently has shown that with dynamic loading levels of 200 cycles at a rate of 0.1 hertz, you can achieve 33% increase in oxygen 
uh, uh, concentration in the nucleus and 22% increase in the annulus, with a sub and also a decrease in lactic acid concentration. So it's very important, obviously, dynamic loading. Given that the thoracic spine is particularly prone to disc degeneration, we, we wanted to know how much the thoracic spine moved, especially since we see it as a fairly immobile area because it's sort of surrounded and fixed by the ribs. So our aim was to measure the frequency at which the thoracic spine moves during an average day. And we also wanted to know whether this frequency was related to the degree of kyphosis whether it was related to age and whether it was related to gender. So uh, we included subjects over 40, so they're all older subjects, um, no osteoporosis, no back pain or previous operations. And our cohort was 56, 18 males and 38 females with an average age of 62. We used a flexible electrogoniometer to measure movement in the sagittal and coronal planes. And I ought to point out here that the coronal plane would have measured um, both rotation and side flexion because they're coupled movements in the thoracic spine. Um, and we moved, measured this movement over a six hour period. And this is the sort of readout we got. And what we did was we took that and we calculated how many times they moved over five degrees because we figured five degrees was a, a good amount of movement for dynamic movement of the thoracic spine. So we had that. Um, w so we had recordings for the whole six-hour period, and then we took out subsets of uh, time spent walking and time spent driving. The statistics we use: we we determine the relationship between the frequency in both planes and age, uh, angle, age, and gender, with a principal component analysis initially, and then followed by post hoc Pearson's correlations co correlation coefficients, and. Here are the results. So, I'd like you to take notice of the fact that these numbers are all cycles per hour, not minute and not second. And if I can show you, first of all, the entire. So, over the whole six hour period, the rate at which our cohort moved well, in the sagittal plane was 5.21 times per hour, and in the coronal plane, 10.44 times per hour, and that equates to 0 0.01 hertz and 0 0.03 hertz. Very, very low frequencies. If we go to walking, they're a wee bit better, but not that much better. In the, in the coronal plane, um, 15 times an hour equates to 0 0.404 hertz. And I'll take you back to this slide I showed you before with this finite element model, where they said that for a nice healthy disc or, you know, really to, to get things going, 200 cycles at 0.1 hertz, there's no way we're doing that in the thoracic spine. So perhaps that's why we get such a lot of degeneration in our thoracic spines as upright creatures. So what was the effect of age? Well, I would have thought that as we aged, we, our movements would become less frequent and that would be significant. But in fact, there was no correlation, no significant correlation between age and frequency. Oops. Oh. Using the wrong button. The effect of gender, well, it could have gone either way. I really wasn't sure. Um, but in fact, females have higher movement frequencies than males in both planes, but it was only significant in the sagittal plane with females at 5.6 and males at 4.4. And the effect of kyphotic angle, well, I had thought that kyphotic angle, as we became more kyphosed, what's written in literature would suggest that we would move less, and in fact, that is the case. As our kyphosis increases, we get a correlation, uh, we get a decrease in frequency, but that was only uh, in, in our cohort, that was only significant in the sagittal plane. So. so to conclude this paper, what we have observed is that the thoracic spine movement frequency is much lower um, than has been reported uh, to promote disc health. Sorry, I've missed out health there. But this particularly in males, and in fact, that's interesting because in the literature, d disc degeneration is more prevalent in males. Reduced movement frequency is related to increased kyphosis, but not to age. So is it increased kyphosis that leads to a decrease in movement frequency and thereby um, disc degeneration, or is it 
decreased frequency of movement that leads to increased kyphosis and disc degeneration? Well, there's clearly a link, but we can't answer that with the data we've got. So for the future, I'd love to do some more. I'd love to look at this movement frequency in the thoracic spine and in other areas as well, um, in younger, in sort of groups uh, over, the, over the age groups um, and have a look what happens in younger people as they age. And also this idea of looking at movement frequency and degeneration of joints may well apply to other joints. For instance, the knee where you get degenerative joint disease. Thank you. So I'll take questions on that particular paper before I move on to the next one, if anybody's got any questions or any, needs any clarification. I have a question over here. Yeah. One be second. <laughs> I can hear you. These stairs are just <laughs> a little dangerous to run down. Is that you? I just wanted to know if you uh, tried rotation you know, measuring the rotation or uh, did you consider at all? Thank you. Um, the device we used, the electric anemometer, which moved, measured, as I showed, the movement in two planes. There is a torsiometer. I could have measured um, rotation but didn't um, because it was just too clumsy an application. But it would be very interesting to look at. But I guess I was looking at this pumping, really. I wanted to look at the pumping action because that's what we're told, that it's this compression um, that's... Sorry, these lights are very bright. Uh, the compression, uh, dynamic compression, which is important for disc health. Any other questions on this paper? Yes, one down here. Um, thank you. Do you think the, um, the use of school bags and the increased compression weight that kids are now carrying is going to bear in the future? Oh, that's an excellent question, and one actually I hadn't considered in the past, but you're absolutely right, um, and it would be really interesting to measure how that affects the frequency at which the, the thoracic spine moves. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor for this paper? No? no? Is it, yeah, you one more down the front here. I would love to know the effect of um, computer games and the Xbox games and this and that and kids becoming more and more sta you know, s sedentary. Um, would you consider looking, you know, or, you know, is there a consideration about that as well? Well, thank you for that. Um, I, I didn't measure kids, but again, that would be very interesting to look at what they do over the day. Certainly our adults um, were pretty immobile. They really weren't moving as much as I expected them to. Um, and if you look down here, I didn't point out in this slide that predictably when people were driving or in the car, their, their um, rates were much, much lower. Their frequency of movement was much lower, which you would expect. But I su would suggest that that might well extrapolate to children at games as well. Yeah, I think we have to look we at that. Just one last question at the back here. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I was wondering, did you record the number of people who had uh, knee or hip osteoarthritis? Uh, given that there might be some research coming out showing that there's increased trunk lateral lean, and in people who have uh, symptomatic knee osteoarthritis? Thank you for that question. Um, I didn't record it specifically, but I know that none of the cohort had any significant knee or hip arthritis. But thank you for the question. It's interesting too. All right, so I'll go on to... Um, oh, someone's doing this for me. That's nice. <laughs> to my next talk. <laughs>